thank you, Rabbi. No, no, no. That's okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. You swear the testimony you give to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Have a seat. And uh, the mic comes on. So these things don't pick up very well, so we'll just ask to pull it up to get some All right? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Just state your name. My name is Mary Susan McGee. Ms. McGee, where are you from? I'm from Montana. Where in Montana? Bozeman. Excuse me, where are you from? Bozeman, B O Z E M A N. I don't think they're on. Okay. All right. Can you tap on that again? Yeah, turn off the electricity. Okay, apparently they're not working. So, Susan, you just have to speak up so they can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, you're from Bozeman, Montana? I'm from Bozeman, Montana, yes. Why did you agree to come all the way down to Austin, Texas today? Because Dr. Brzezinski saved my life. Um, tell us a little bit of the, something about yourself. Are you married? I'm married. I've been married for 52 years. You have any children? I have three children and nine grandchildren. Uh, what kind of cancer were you diagnosed with? I was diagnosed with esophageal cancer on uh, May 11th in Bozeman. May 11th of what year? 1911. Uh, well, 2011. 2011. I'm going to yeah. step out here. 2011, I'm sorry. I'm, I apologize. Do you want us to wait, Jay? No, I was thinking about the fact that it was 11-11. <laughs> um, and was that stage four esophageal cancer? Well, in Bozeman, I had, um, I had gone to the doctor because when I was drinking a beer one night when I came home, I thought, that is different. And so uh, I went in to see him. I just mentioned it uh, kind of casually. He get, immediately signed me up in two days for um, uh, um, ultra, uh, not an ultrasound, but a um, Okay, now I am nervous. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Take your time. Um, you know, so. he did a test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Totally gone blank. So okay. I've only said that word about 5,000 times in my life. A what? She didn't hear you. She didn't hear you. She just didn't hear you. She's trying to take it all down. Okay. So so I I was, mics aren't working, so you, so just, you just have to, to speak it. up. I'm sorry. Oh, it's not working at all. No. Um, Yes, he tested, he, he brought me in on Tuesday and um, he told me when I got off the table, he said, you need to go to the Mayo Clinic. Well, we were headed to Argentina in about three days. So, and my husband lives for these trips, hunting trips to Argentina. We go every year, we've gone for over 20 years. And uh, so I, I said, well, I don't want you to say anything. I don't want anybody to know about this until I get home. I'm going to go to Argentina with my husband. Why ruin the trip? And uh, I didn't really want to tell him that I had cancer before we left. So when we got home, I told Peter that I had cancer and uh, that Dr. Landsberg had wanted me to go to uh, the Mayo Clinic. And I grew up in Minnesota. I graduated from the University of Minnesota. My brothers lived there. Uh, MD Anderson contacted me as well, uh, but Rochester was our preference, and we we were there with in the month. Uh, I think it was almost exactly a month that we got into the Mayo Clinic in June. Uh, how old were you when you were diagnosed? I was 68. I had it turned 68 in April. So, tell me, uh, Miss Mickey, what goes through your head when you hear that kind of diagnosis? You know, I just felt it was in God's hands, uh, and uh, I didn't really feel any fear or anything. I think most of your emotions are directed towards your family. It was devastating for Peter and my children. Uh, when, who did you see at the Mayo Clinic? I saw a doctor, his name was Joseph Murray. He was in charge of my case. Um, he uh, arranged all my tests and everything from what I could gather. The Mayo Clinic, you, kind of, you get a number and you have it for the rest of your life. And they kind of herd you through there. Um, 
and some of it's you know just repetitive like my weight would change from floor to floor my height would change from floor you know there was a certain amount of that but they get all of these records on you and then you meet with the doctor who's in charge of your care and this was this doctor's name was Joseph Murray and when I was sitting in the room waiting for him to come in the nurse came in and she said you're so fortunate this doctor is world renowned so I knew that I had somebody that uh, special who was looking at this and um, I had a series of tests, it was a CT scan, and uh, I know it was both a CT scan and a PET scan, and uh, one day of testing and all the other weight height things and oxygen, and uh, they test everything, and then uh, I wanted to just go for a drive. We had some others. Uh, I spent a long time talking to Dr. Murray initially, and then I just wanted to go for a ride. I wanted to get away from the Mayo Clinic. Um, and so we were out in the country and he called us back after the PET scan that I had in the morning. And I knew that I knew it probably wasn't good news I mean, uh, because he kind of changed the schedule. Um, and when I got back there, uh, he just shook his head. Ms. McGee, let me ask you this. What did he tell you? Uh, did he confirm your diagnosis? Yes. Did he? tell you it had metastasized? I saw that on the, uh, yes. Where it had it metastasized it, to? I saw, actually saw the PET scan, it was everywhere. I mean, my whole body, my whole trunk lit up. Um, what did I do? can't be real specific about that because, but it looked like it was around my heart, lungs, liver, you know, it just, everything was lit. What did he <coughs> suggest, or what did he tell you your options were? He talked to me for a long time. He said, um, you know, uh, how about if we just don't do anything? He said, uh, I have friends, his mother was a doctor. He was Catholic, I'm Catholic. I have a relationship with God, I wasn't totally rattled, but I just said I had a very good life and I'm, you know, I'm okay with it. And he said, I've got some friends, doctor friends who had esophageal cancer and they didn't, they chose not to be treated went home and he went through that with me. I listened to all of that um, and uh, I was I was good with it. Was it your understanding that you were stage four esophageal cancer? Yes, I absolutely understood that. And, you, and you? I had looked up, excuse me, but <coughs> before I went to Argentina with Peter, of course, I didn't know what esophageal cancer was. So I went on Wikipedia and looked up and I think it's I don't think you have to even be stage two to have less than a 2% of survival. I knew that I was in pretty, you know, my time limit might be pretty short. Uh, what did you do next <clears throat> after you left the Mayo Clinic? Um, I told Peter, he had a dog, a new dog that he sent down to a trainer in Colorado. And I said, uh, I want to go and get that dog. And he didn't want to because it was a little too far a drive and I, yeah, you should drive through Nebraska if you want to be bored to death. Um, and, uh, but I pushed on it because I knew he was going to need that dog. Um, who did you see next with respect to your medical care? Your well, cancer? I went home and um, uh, I actually had a big party with my friends, you know, and, and the kids, I never thought about it, but I just wanted to see some people before I died. I knew I was gonna die. And, uh, but my, and I, I had to tell the children, I told them before I went to the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Peter insisted that I tell them. I really didn't want to tell them, but, um, because I, you know, it's, it's that time frame between finding out and death that's so hard in your family. And I wanted to shorten that. But, um, when I came home, uh, from the Mayo Clinic, um, Sunny, of course, she was 30 something, 35. Sunny's your daughter? Sunny's my youngest daughter. She's at that age where she reads all of that stuff that I no longer read. I'm not the personality that checks on all that's available. And she had uh, looked at all the options. My children were not going to say, oh, well, this is it. And. Uh, Sunny in particular was the driving force. She had read Suzanne Summers' book, 
before I ever went to the Mayo Clinic, she read that, um, and she had all kinds of ideas of what, how, what we were gonna do besides give up. And I mentioned that to Dr. Joseph Murray. I said, you know, uh, have you ever heard of that Susan, Susan Summers? And he said, oh, is that that exercise lady? And that's, so I knew he had heard of her, but whether he read the book, I have an idea. How did you hear about Dr. Brzezinski? Was that through your daughter, Sunny? Yes. Um, did you, and you didn't do any independent research yourself? Nothing. Um, when did you, so I'm assuming you, like <laughs> I'm assuming you contacted the Brzezinski Clinic, correct? Yes, we called and they said that they would see us. When did you uh, first come down to Houston? July. The kids couldn't couldn't make it happen fast enough. July 2011. Uh, and did you start treatment at the Brzezinski Clinic in July 2011? Well, uh, we didn't go right into treatment. We, you know, there's a you meet with uh, the doctors and. Uh, you know, I was, I had a physical and, but you know, we were committed to, uh, uh, to going with him, but the, especially after we had the uh, conference, and Dr. Brzezinski was there. I, um, you know, you, you form impressions of people and I had a very good impression of both Joseph Murray at the Mayo Clinic and I had a good impression of Dr. Brzezinski. He was very humble and he said to me, um, I don't know if we can help you or not, but I've heard it's pretty good on the other side if, I, if we can't make it, so. He so, never told me I was gonna die. Dr. Joseph Murray never said I was gonna die either. That came later from another doctor, but Dr. Uh, Dr. Joseph Murray said, you know, when after he kind of said, you know, shook his head, he said, but I've seen it all, prayer, and you know, he, he never said I was going to die. Like some some oncologists told me that outright. Let me let me talk to you about your initial visit to the Brzezinski Clinic. Um, who did you you remember that day? Yes. Who who was present at at your initial visit? Um, Dr. Rachmano, Dr. Valderas, uh, the oncologist from Peru. Um, Dr. Brzezinski was sitting at the head of the table, and Valderas was right here and Rachmana was right there, my husband was here. I'm not sure if Dr. Marquis was there or not. Um, At the initial visit? Yeah, I was mainly, I. they assigned me, Dr. Rachmana was kind of like a- Dr. Who? Rachmana, I call him Dr. Rachmana. He was kind of like a physician's assistant. He never, uh, and he kind of lit up, because I. he was my communicator. He got his instructions from Dr. Brzezinski or Dr. Marquis or Dr. Valderas, and... Did anyone ever tell you that Dr. Rachmanov was a licensed physician in Texas? No, I knew he was not. They advised you from the beginning that he was not licensed? Yeah, I think he might have told me. I, I knew he wasn't. Okay. Uh, did that make a difference to no. you? No. Uh, did Dr. Rachmanov ever provide you with any, uh, did he examine you or treat you or diagnose you in any way? Objection. Did well, his uh, son. Wait, wait, wait. Hold, hold on. Okay. When they're when the attorney objects, you just need to stop. Okay. The lawyers get through arguing. <laughs> the judge says, "Okay, go ahead." So, uh, I'll, I'll rephrase it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Miss McGee, did Dr. Rodmanoff ever um, provide any medical treatment to you? No. Dr. Rachmanov? No. Yes. He did. was the communicator, as I said before, and he was the one we interrogated about everything. And then, you know, I mean, Debbie, my middle daughter, is like very intense, and she wanted to know everything. And so she, but then she started going straight to Marquis because she, she didn't even want the, you know, the middleman. Um, and that's how I saw it. So Dr. Rachmanov never prescribed anything for you? No. Uh, you know, he didn't have any authority. I was well aware of that. And when you had questions, did you pose those questions to Dr. Rotmanov? Well, if we did, he would say, well, I have to consult with Dr. Brzezinski or Dr. Marquis. Always, we knew that he was just the vehicle. And what uh, he would, I, I loved him because he was, called me all the time. He's a very good support system. Who was the oncologist on your case at the Brzezinski Clinic? Valderas. Is that, is that the doctor from Peru that you yes. just mentioned? 
what were you, um, it, during that initial meeting, did they propose treatment for you? Well, you go to the Keras lab, you know, you get your blood work done, and um, they make a decision um, about the, they told me immediately, uh, when the, at the first visit, we use chemotherapy. So I knew that. Um, and I knew that they didn't use radiation, and I knew that it was considered destructive, which I believe myself, so, and I knew, you know, they have to treat you with something. So I, I was aware of that, I was okay with that. I knew my hair was gonna fall out, everybody's does. Um, uh, so. Did you get, so they told you you were gonna have some chemotherapy? Mm -hmm. Did you, I didn't know did, what though, they hadn't told me what yet. They didn't decide on that, and then they altered it after I got back to um, we're kind of getting ahead of, ahead yeah. of ourselves. Let me, let me just ask you some direct questions. And, um, in addition to the chemotherapy, were you giving, given any other medications? Yes, you, uh, I took PB. Um, just sodium phenylbutyrate? Yes. Were you told what the PB was for? I, my understanding was it kind of prepared my cells to accept the, um, the chemotherapy and um, but Sunny, I told Sunny I wish she could have come. She was dying to come to this trial because she had, she understood everything. Uh, and you know, I kind of relaxed because I had those two kids with me and the doctors could only stand so much <laughs> as far as questions and so forth. So I let them take the lead on it. You know, I mean, it was their... Do you have confidence in the doctors at the Brzezinski Clinic? Absolutely, I do. Did you find them to be caring and compassionate? Yes, they were wonderful. Um, did you understand that there, Dr. Vyderis, the oncologist, um, did you understand he was the physician leading her care? I understood that he was leading the chemotherapy drug. He's the one that wrote all of the prescriptions to, for the other doctor to follow, yes. Was it a... Um, did you understand that the oncologist, Dr. Vyderis, was the one that was uh, developing your treatment plan? Yes, but I thought it was kind of a team. You know, I mean, they were talking to each other, but yes, I thought, I think that he was definitely in charge of the drugs. Did anyone at the Brzezinski Clinic explain to you that they used uh, genetic targeted therapy to, for treatment of your cancer? Yes. And you understood what that meant? Yes. And this is what I saw, if you want uh, another. Ms. McGee, just answer the question. Don't give my no, uh, side. Yeah, no. just ask what you're asking. Okay. Uh, answer what you're asking. Um, was it explained to you that the medications you were being provided were being prescribed off-label? I'm not sure what you mean about that. The, the combination of the medications that you were being prescribed were being prescribed. I knew it was their own cocktail, if that's what you mean, yes. Did anyone discuss with you the fact that these were being prescribed uh, in combination, uh, but not necessarily, um, oh, strike that. That it wasn't the usual. Oh. Did you, did you understand <laughs> that it wasn't the usual um, uh, manner in yes. which these drugs were prescribed. You know what? I was, they told me I was going to die at the Mayo Clinic, so yes, I understood that. Did they explain the potential side effects of these medications to you? Well, they don't, no, not all of them. I mean, I knew there were going to be some. I don't think they knew what my body would do with each of these drugs. Sure, but did they explain to you what the most common risks and side effects of the medications were? I think that yes. You understood those. Okay, you need to verbally say yes. The yes. The reporter can't get your eyes. <laughs> and I won't wave at you anymore either. <laughs> were, you, were you ever guaranteed that those drugs in the combination that you were given would cure your cancer? Were you ever given a guarantee? No. And you've been a cancer survivor for how many years? Five years. When you were at the Brzezinski Clinic, did you sign consent forms? I'm sure I must have. 
um, yeah, I know we're in the office and, you know, there's a process, they're in business, so yes. You don't have a specific recollection of signing them? I kind of do. Um, there's an, you know, you have to sign up to commit to him, yes. Would you have read those consent forms before you signed them? I never read anything before I sign it. <laughs> My <laughs> husband did. <laughs> Your husband read them? Did he explain to you what those consent forms said? Yes, I mean, I was pretty aware. I glanced at it all. Were you giving They explained it, I think, now that I'm thinking back. It was quite a while ago. That wasn't the consent forms. Well, okay, here we go again. Were you given the opportunity to ask questions before signing any of the documents at the Brzezinski Clinic? Was I what? Were you given the opportunity to ask questions? Sure. Uh, it was very um, friendly, informal. They were trying to advise me about what was in the form. Did you feel like you had uh, all the information you needed before signing those consent forms? Yes. <coughs> Over the course of your treatment and once you returned back to Montana, did you have occasion to call the clinic at any time? Uh, I spoke to them frequently. How often would the clinic contact you? Once a week. Would that always be Dr. Wakamano? Usually. Dr. Marquis later picked it up. And were all of your questions that you might have had answered to your satisfaction? Yes, uh, absolutely. were you at the Brzezinski Clinic before you returned to Montana? Almost two months, I think. We're, it might have been, it, we went after the beginning of July, and I think we were home before the end of August, so maybe it was like four or five weeks. Not certain exact the, the dates of that. Who uh, administered the medications for you once you got back to Montana? I had to find a doctor who would agree to work with Dr. Brzezinski. I first, uh, I wasn't real interested in, in using, uh, should I speak or go ahead and say yes or no? Just answer, just answer the question the way you want to answer it. If there's an objection, you'll hear it. Go ahead. Um, I wasn't really interested in Bozeman. Three of my closest friends, in fact, one of my very closest friends was diagnosed with esophageal cancer the same week I was, he lived in Bozeman. He was dead by um, two weeks after I got home. He didn't, uh, I didn't like, I, did, I don't think Bozeman's on the cutting edge when it comes to medical and we have the means to go elsewhere. Uh, obviously, I had to be treated regularly, so we went to Billings. Um, and Dr. Hensel, anyway, in, in uh, Bozeman, to get, he wouldn't work with Dr. Brzezinski. He wouldn't do some of the, uh, he didn't want to do anything with the Avastin infusions. So I called Billings and I said, would you be willing to work with Dr. Brzezinski? Uh, I know not everyone does. And uh, his little nurse, Mandy, said, well, we do. And so we made the appointment and Dr. Nieva, who is the chair of oncology there, he took, he took the case. And I think he's the only doctor at the Billings Clinic that's willing to work with uh, alternative uh, medicine like that. So it was Dr. Nieva that was uh, monitoring your care in mm -hmm. Montana. But he didn't think I was going to live. He made that pretty clear. <coughs> when did you first uh, learn that you were having a positive response to the medications? Well, it kind of went like this. Do you want me to explain the, the journey? Or? Briefly. The first time, when I first walked in, he said, you need to get on hospice. I who was, said, who I, was that? This is Dr. Nieva. And I just would like to say everyone who I met, everyone was trying to help me, everybody. So I had no object, you know, every doctor sees things differently. But they were all good people, and they were all trying to make me better. The next visit, he said, you may think you're going to get out of this, but you're not. The next visit, he thought I had cancer in my neck. It was kind of a negative thing for my husband. By Late November, I went in uh, for another PET scan, and he said, 
wow, I've got to take better care of you. You're having an amazing result to these um, medications. So within so four he months. kind of he was and the other oncologist now, uh, Nieva went down to USC to do research. Um, she okay, told. Your answer. Okay, that was kind of a long. Okay. Great. Yeah, just answer. Yes, question, sir. but okay. don't keep batting on to it. Who took over for Dr. Nieva? Pamela Smith. So within four months of starting the treatment at the Brzezinski Clinic, you were having, your PET scans were showing that your cancer was diminishing. Is that correct? It was almost completely gone. By, within four months? Well, by December, I mean, I looked at the PET scan, and there was just a few cancer cells at the bottom of the esophagus. And the doctors in uh, Billings told you by December 2011 that your cancer was almost gone? Well, they said you're having a remarkable um, response to this uh, treatment. And I had a lot of these endoscopic exams that were, I couldn't remember why I could had a block there, I don't know, but um, they were constant. They were looking all the time to try to find something. And they weren't able to, is that correct? Yeah, she needs a verbal no. response. <laughs> For one second. <laughs> From my first trial. <laughs> Ms. McGee, um, how, you've been cancer-free for five years. I have been. Um, how, long af how long did you continue your treatment at the Brzezinski Clinic? Uh, it didn't end in December. It probably went on through, I want to say, March. Um, March of 2012. Since yes. March, since March of 2012, have you had a recurrence of your cancer? No. Have you had to take any medications or any treatments for cancer? Uh, no, I don't take any medications for cancer, but I am constantly being tested by the Billings Clinic uh, to see if it's coming back. Like I have a PET scan every three months, and I have these endoscopic exams. They did send me to the University of Minnesota for an endoscopic ultrasound because they didn't have the equipment in Montana. And Dr. Greeno, the head oncologist at uh, the University of Minnesota, saw me there. He came in on his day off. He was so interested. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Just kind of limit yourself <laughs> to the question you're asking. From your personal experience as a patient at Brzezinski Clinic, uh, did you ever feel that Dr. Brzezinski or anyone at the clinic ever misrepresented the effectiveness of the treatment you were going to be receiving? No. Uh, did you uh, ever feel that anyone at the Brzezinski Clinic or Dr. Brzezinski uh, ever failed to communicate with you or your family? No. Uh, did you ever feel that anyone at the Brzezinski Clinic, including Dr. Brzezinski, ever misrepresented the cost of the treatment to you? No. Uh, from your personal experience at the Brzezinski Clinic, do you believe that Dr. Brzezinski and or Br the Brzezinski Clinic engaged in any false billing? No. Were you ever uh, advised that you needed to take any supplements? No. Were you charged for the treatment you received at the Brzezinski Clinic? Yes. Uh, it's kind of been folded in. <laughs> it's fine. Yes was fine. Yes was fine. Let me go on. Were you, uh, were those charges, in your opinion, fair? Yes. Uh, did, uh, someone at the clinic discuss the billing issues with you before you started treatment? Absolutely. Uh, did they explain the charges? Yes. Uh, at any time did you feel like the clinic rushed you through the finance issues? No. Or did you ever feel pressured? No. At any time did you feel like the clinic was charging you unreasonably? No. Did you feel like the clinic was forthcoming and honest with you about the charges for the treatment? Yes. What have you been doing, uh, Ms. McGee, since being cancer-free? Well, I have two new grandchildren. I have nine grandchildren, so that was a blessing. Um, and I have a job. I own a business. I've owned it for 35 years. It's a big flower shop in Bozeman. It's the largest. I have employees, so I work almost every day. When did you arrive in Austin for this hearing? Last night, 9.30. And, and you said you own a floral shop? I do. And so you traveled to Austin on Mother's Day weekend? Yes. 
is that one of your busiest weekends? Yes. Not an easy trip for you, was it? It was okay. It was a long trip for you. It was right? a long trip, but he's totally worth it. It was that important for you to be here, right? He saved my life. Did you pay your own expenses? I did. Why is that? Because I owe him my life. Have you ever been paid by the Brzezinski Clinic or Dr. Brzezinski to testify on his behalf? No. Do you believe you would be alive without Dr. Brzezinski? I know I would not be. Thank you. Okay, before we move on, uh, folks, uh, the spectators need to be over here to the right, please. We don't want to have anybody behind the council desk. To the right there. My name is Barbara Jordan, and I'm an attorney with the Texas Medical Board. Good morning. Good morning. Um, before I get started, I just want to say that I think everyone in this room is glad that you're able to be here today and speak with us. Well, thank you. Um, obviously, it's amazing to hear what you can answer. Um, uh, were you aware that uh, what we call the rule was invoked in this case? The what? The rule? I'm not sure what you um, were you aware that you are not, uh, since you're a witness in this case, you are not uh, supposed to speak with anyone um, about your testimony today other than um, the lawyers involved in this case? Are you aware of that? Well, I am not, and I don't know anybody anyway, so. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so did you speak with anyone no. before I'm here today? Um, have you watched any of the trial um, online? No. Okay. Um, have you followed it in the media? No. Okay. Um, have you talked with anybody who has? No. I'm pretty busy. Excuse me? I said I'm pretty busy. I, said, I just have to ask these questions. Um, Do you know if anyone in your family is following the trial? No, they're not. They're busy too. Uh, and you said that um, your expenses were not paid um, by Dr. Brzezinski to travel here in this matter. Has he ever reimbursed you for expenses to travel? No. Uh, have you ever testified uh, in a hearing for Dr. Brzezinski before? No. no. I'm wondering why he's no, such a chatterbox. <laughs> Have you ever given a statement to the media on uh, behalf of Dr. Brzezinski? No. Okay. Um, and you don't have any medical training, do you? No. Does anyone in your family have any medical training? No. Patients who were treated by Dr. Brzezinski? No. Um, okay, so, so you've obviously testified today about um, the great results that you've had um, visiting the Brzezinski Clinic. Are you aware of any patients who maybe didn't have such a good outcome? No. Well, I know that um, the woman, one woman, she ran into my car in the parking lot, uh, the rental car because Dr. Brzezinski, her son had a brain tumor and uh, it, he was too far, she was totally upset. And Dr. Brzezinski had told her that, you know, there was nothing he could do. Okay. So it's possible then that your remarkable recovery is not something that every patient who visits the clinic would experience. Objection calls for speculation. Um, have you Are you aware if uh, any details of your story are published online? No. Okay. Um, would you be surprised to learn that there's a short uh, statement about the care you received on the Brzezinski Patient Group website? Well, I did write a little thing in response when I was questioned that I couldn't believe that uh, 
this remarkable man was being abused on the internet. I mean, it's malicious the internet just thing. So I did write a short thing, paragraph. Um, Who did you send it to? I think I might have sent it to Mary Jo Siegel. Okay, so you're, you know her. I don't know her. Okay. You know of her? I know of her. Okay. And you found it through over the internet? Uh, I emailed it or something. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Thank you so much for answering my questions. You're welcome. Pass the witness. Nothing further. All right, thank you. May this witness be excused? Yes. Ms. Jordan. Oh, yes. All right, thank you, Ms. McGee. You're excused. You can go home if you wish or you can stay. Okay, who we got next? Well, our next wit witness is uh, on call, just Dr. Mark Levin. Couldn't sit here, so I sent him downstairs. So maybe we take about a ten minute break. Take a ten minute break and we'll get him.